A Christmas Fog by John Strange Winter 1. I may as well say at once that I, Miranda Cheap, am not a young girl. I have heard it said that when one sits down to tell a story, one ought to take the public completely into one's confidence, and put the reader in the same category as one's lawyer, one's doctor, and one's banker. Well, I have no doubt that the advice is excellently good, and therefore I will say at once that I am not a young girl. I belong as yet to the noble army of spinsters, and when my last parent died, leaving me a modest but sufficient competence upon which to support myself, I did not do what so many unmarried women seem to think the right thing and go to live with one of my married sisters. But after leaving the large house in which my mother had lived and died, I took my share of the furniture and settled myself down in the smallest flat that I could find in all London. My sister Rose said that I was funny and independent. I agreed with her that I was independent, but I could not see anything particularly funny in my arrangements. My sister Maud, who had seven children under fourteen, said she thought I was horribly selfish. Because I did not happen to have got married, as my sisters had done, I had collared, yes, that was the word she used, I had collared an extra three hundred pounds a year, and now I went and lived by myself and gave nobody else the benefit of it. Then Susie had her say, Now Susie is a rich woman, money is no object to her, but she is always in trouble with her servants, and Susie wanted my mother's useful maid to go into her household and help to look after the next generation. Now, Barbara had been my nurse before she was my mother's maid, and it had always been an understood thing between my mother and Barbara and myself that I was never to turn my back upon her, and if I had told her that she would have to leave me and go to live with Mrs. Sargent, that was Susie's married name, I think poor Barbara would have broken her heart. But to tell you the truth, I never thought of such a thing. Susie had a husband who could protect her. I hadn't anybody. I was not able to afford to keep more servants than Barbara and a young cook, and naturally Barbara was, under these circumstances, absolutely essential to my well-being. My sister-in-law, Mrs. Horace Cheap, also cast her eye upon Barbara, and another sister of hers, who was no earthly relation to us, even went so far as to offer her double the wages that I was able to give her, if only she would go and take charge of her nursery. However, the family discussion came to an end at last, and Barbara and I took up our abode in our new home on the second floor of Rosemary Mansions. Well, dear reader, this has not very much to do with my story, and yet it is necessary that I should slightly sketch out the main lines of my previous life. Somehow, it had always been an uneventful existence. I think it is often so with the only one of a large family who remains to the end in the parent nest. My sisters had all paired off and had made new nests for themselves. I stayed behind to make my mother's last days happy, partly because I had no wish to desert her, and partly, to be quite frank, because I had never had any temptation to do so. And yet I was quite as good-looking as any of my sisters, and I was certainly quite as agreeable in myself, if not more so. But from the days when I was just out of my teens, it always seemed to be an understood thing in the Cheap family that Miranda was an unromantic person who would never have a love story or get married as all the others had done. And so, when the incident happened of which I am about to tell you, I had got to the mature age of thirty-four, and I had never had a lover in my life. My eldest sister, Susie, had married very young, and had three daughters who seemed all likely to follow in her footsteps. The eldest of the three, Doreen, was a tall, pretty, lively girl of nearly eighteen. She was my godchild, and my favourite among all my nieces, and right merrily did she take advantage of her position as such. "'Aunt Miranda,' she would say to me, 
I want you to take me in for a few days. My people are going off to Bournemouth or some other place, and I have several engagements in town that I don't want to miss. She never said if you can do with me, and I never told her to wait until I invited her. And I generally found that the engagements consisted of some arrangement with a young man, and that I had to take her to a concert or a theatre or a dance, as the case might be. When the third or fourth young man of the kind was introduced to me, I asked Doreen seriously when she was going to be married. Oh, I don't think, Aunt Miranda," she replied promptly, "that I feel like marrying any of them. But, my dear." You really ought not to encourage these young men unless you mean to marry one of them. It's not the proper thing to do at all. Does your mother know? Oh yes, mother knows," said Dorian cheerfully. "Mother says if I marry under two or three thousand a year, I shall be a fool, and so I should. But one can have a little fun without thinking of marrying." I read her a little lecturette upon the mistaken policy of frittering away one's life. Well, Auntie, she said quite cheerfully, by all accounts you have not frittered your life away, and yet here you are, left high and dry, and as much alone in the world as if you had not a single relation on all the earth. For the first time in my life, I felt a hideous sense of loneliness creeping over me. And for an hour after the child had gone gaily off to a tea party at some house near by, I sat wondering what I should feel like when another thirty-four years had gone by, and I should still be living in this flat or some other quite by myself. It was just a week before Christmas. By some freak, the sergeant family had all gone out of town, excepting Doreen, who had flatly refused to be taken away from several dances. For which she had engaged herself from the first waltz to the very last. It is all the same to you, mother," was her argument. Whether I go down to that dull old house in the country, or whether I stay up in town with Aunt Miranda, I hate the country, particularly in winter, and more particularly in a hired house in a neighbourhood where you hardly know a soul. It's a ghastly idea, mother, of which I'm sure you will all bitterly repent ere the time is at an end. So, dear darling mother, do leave me with Aunt Miranda, and we shall be two happy old maids eating our Christmas dinner together. My sister Susie was always inclined to shift her burdens onto other people's shoulders, and although I don't mean to imply that Doreen was a burden. Still, she was one of Susie's responsibilities. So, when the family took their departure for a rambling country house in one of the wildest parts of Yorkshire, Doreen, accompanied by several large dress baskets, came to me. I think it was the fact of its being Christmas, as well as Doreen's remark, that first made me realise how lonely, how very lonely, I had been. She was such a good child. She was so sweet-tempered and cheerful, and so popular with other young people that she soon turned my quiet flat into as bright a corner of the world as you could well find in any part of London. Miss Doreen makes a good deal of traffic," said Barbara to me when Doreen had been with us about three days. "Yes, Barbara." I replied, "But it is good for us. You and I are two old things who want stirring up and rousing out of our selfish old maidism." "No, Miss Miranda," said Barbara. "There is not much of the old maid about you." I sighed. "I don't know, Barbara," I said. "I begin to feel very old and very much of a maiden lady. It is not a pleasant feeling." I had then been living for several years at Rosemary Mansions. You know the particular block of flats, of course, that I mean, but perhaps you don't know that they are built in a very unusual form. There are four separate sets of flats in the one great square building. Each of the four sides has its entrance, its large hall, its great door mats with "Salve" written upon them, its liveried porter, and its convenient lift. 
and each hall goes right through to the courtyard at the back, so that from each one can communicate with any one of the other three sets of flats. Well, it happened one day just before Christmas, the day before Christmas Eve to be exact, that Dorian went to help some friends to deck a Christmas tree, which was to form one of the attractions at a party at which we were bidden for the following evening. The tree was to be followed by a dance with a cotillion, and I understood from Dorian that the favours for the cotillion were to be something very unusual and out of the common. As Doreen was fully occupied that afternoon, I took the opportunity of going out to buy a present for her. She had been with me to buy the various presents that were necessary for me to send to the other members of the family, but until that moment I had not had an opportunity of buying for Doreen a certain article of jewellery which I knew she was most anxious to possess. It was a horrid afternoon, stingingly cold, with an inclination to fog. I took a cab as far as Oxford Street and there made my purchase. Then I passed Bouchard's, and it occurred to me that I should be wise if I took home with me an extra cake or so, because although I had weeks before ordered my usual supply of Christmas dainties, the advent of Doreen had made it more than likely that we should find ourselves very badly off for nice things for afternoon tea. Not that Doreen ate so much, you know. I don't mean that. But Doreen had such a train of young men, and Doreen had so many girlfriends, and young men and young girls do get through a good deal of plum cake and such things when they congregate together. And so I thought it would be a good thing if I stepped into Bouchard's and bought some extra things which I could carry home with me. I bought a three-pound plum cake and a two-pound cherry cake and put them into the first hansom that I saw. Rosemary Mansions, Westminster, was the direction I gave the Jehu. I saw with dismay that the fog was thickening visibly, and as we descended towards the Houses of Parliament, it had become almost impossible to distinguish the houses as we passed. More than once we were blocked by the traffic. And my Jehu made one or two hoarse remarks to me through the trap door that he was afraid he would find Rosemary Mansions very difficult to get at. I told him cheerfully to do his best, that I would give him something extra, but I cannot say that I felt very cheerful. Here was I, a lone woman sitting in a cab in a neighbourhood which I did not recognise, with a handsome piece of jewellery in my hand, a well-filled purse in my pocket. And two heavy cakes on the seat beside me, my driver made one or two inquiries and took some obviously wrong turnings. But at last he drew up at the door of Rosemary Mansions, and I got out of the cab with a sigh of relief. I gave him double fare, and he told me that he would walk his horse right home and not attempt to earn another penny that night. You see, lady, he said, it goes down your throat and down your horse's throat. So oh my go straight! I bade him good night and a merry Christmas. As I went up the steps, I looked up in order to make sure that I had arrived at my own entrance. For as I said before, there were four entrances to Rosemary Mansions, each one with the name plainly written above the portals, and below the name one of the first four letters of the alphabet. I lived in Rosemary Mansions A. The fog was, however, too thick for me to distinguish the letters, so I passed within, knowing that it would be perfectly easy to find my own staircase from the porters. Oh yes, this was my own hall. I recognised the crimson carpets, the great door mats, the porter's bench, and the dog lying before the fire, which blazed in a semi-open grate. But there was no porter about, which was very unusual at that hour. I supposed that Doggett, as our porter was called, had either gone upstairs with a message, or else down below to his own apartment to get his tea. I looked into the porter's lodge to see if there were any letters for me, but a glance told me that there was not a single letter in the rack. As I did not choose to disturb Doggett at his tea, I quietly walked up the staircase without troubling to wait for the lift. Oh, how horrid the fog was! It made one think kindly even of the rambling country house in the wilds of distant Yorkshire. 
Indeed, it was so heavy and so thick that it had worked its way within doors, and the electric lights at various points of the stairs shone with a curious yellow radiance, and each had a sort of halo surrounding it. I reached my own door and rang the bell. Nobody came. I rang again and again, but there was no response. How was it that everybody was out of the way this afternoon? I suppose Barbara had gone off buying Christmas things. Then where was Jane? I felt impatiently in my pocket to see if I had my key. I had. I opened the door with a sigh of relief. How very extraordinary! All was in darkness. I drew the key out of the lock, shut the door behind me, and passing on through the inner door, which was of heavy ground glass, closed it behind me. It shut with a little click. How odd! I had never heard the door click like that before. I groped my hand along the wall, feeling for the switches of the electric light. Why, what had happened? There was no switch. I went back to the door, which now was closed quite tightly. I could find no handle, so I went back again to feel for the switches of the electric light, but could not discover them. How extraordinary, and how curious the effect of this yellow fog was! It made not only the streets, but my own house feel strange. Never mind, I should find a light in the dining room, probably a fire. Certainly there would be one in the kitchen. I turned towards the door of the dining room, which was the first on the left after the second door of entrance, but I could not find any sign of an electric switch. Then it dawned upon me that I had mistaken my block and my flat, and here was I shut up in the dark in a flat belonging to some unknown person. I groped my way back to the inner door of the entrance. No, I could find no trace of a handle upon it. I shook it, I knocked upon it, but with no result, excepting that I hurt my knuckles even through my thick winter gloves. At this point I put my two heavy cakes, which I had still been carrying, down upon the floor, and set myself to make a tour of the apartments. The entrance was evidently precisely of the same proportions as my own, and it was furnished. I came in turn to an umbrella stand, one of those tall porcelain pipes which held several sticks and umbrellas, and to a carved hall bench, then to a table. I dropped over a doormat and felt the outlines of one or two pictures. Then I touched a brush and something that felt in the dark like a fox's head. It was certainly the stuffed head of some small animal. At last I reached the kitchen door, hoping to find a fire there. No, all was dark. If only I had had a light, the situation would not have been so bad. But although I groped about for at least ten minutes, I could not find a single box of matches. At last I came to what was evidently the kitchen easy chair. And in that I sat myself down, wondering what on earth I should do next. I might try ringing the bells, so I started on a tour round the kitchen, shinning myself violently several times ere I remembered that I should not find any bell pull there. Then I groped my way once more to the door which led to the corridor, and felt with my hand along the wall for the door of the dining room. I knocked down a chair and, I think, a small table. Then I ran against the sideboard. Crash! There was a sound of falling glass. Oh, dear! I had smashed something belonging to someone I did not know, and I had cut myself. At last, however, I did find the little knob of the electric bell, and had the satisfaction of hearing it tinkling away in the kitchen which I had just left. Ringing the bell was no good. I went back to the door which led into the corridor, but mind you, when I say I went, I mean that I arrived there after a progress involving much need of patience and the receipt of many hard knocks. Then I nerved myself to speak. Is there anybody there? I said. 
I have a refined and ladylike voice, which my dear mother always used to say was one of my greatest charms. It sounded so soft and inefficient as I sat there in the darkness, and I resolved to speak in a much louder and more determined tone. Is anybody there? My voice echoed down the corridor, but no answering voice came out of the darkness in reply. I then determined to make a complete tour of the apartments. I explored the drawing room, the dining room, the little study, the large bedroom, the spare bedroom, the kitchen, the bathroom, and the servant's bedroom all in turn. And after the manner of the blind, I examined with my hands each chimney shelf in case I might come across one precious box of matches. But although I resolutely carried this idea into effect, I did not light upon a single one. And at this point I sat down and wept. It was the day before Christmas Eve. Perhaps the owner of the flat had gone away for the holidays. I could not get out of that front door. I had nothing to eat, and there was nothing but water to drink. I had already touched the tap in the kitchen so that I knew I should not die of thirst. But I might be locked up in that flat for ten days or more, and the only sustenance I knew of was tap water and two bouchard cakes. So I sat down and wept, wept piteously, until I suddenly became aware that I was chilled to the very marrow of my bones. I wondered what they would do at home. What would Doreen think? What would Barbara say? Would they go to the police? Would they go the round of the hospitals? Would the cabman, to whom I had given double fare, come and give evidence that he had driven such a lady as Doreen would describe to one of the entrances to Rosemary Mansions? I tried to console myself with the assurance that, after all, Rosemary Mansions was a highly respectable building, where tenants were not accepted unless they gave the very highest of references, that nobody who came and found me there eventually would believe that a woman of my position and means had come with any felonious intent. In the meantime, I must make the best of a bad situation. I must resign myself to sitting there in the dark and in the cold, and be thankful that I had bought those two cakes with a view of helping out Christmas. Little did I think when I entered Bouchard's busy, attractive shop that they would probably prove themselves a barrier between me and starvation. By this time I was yearning for my tea. If only I had been able to find a match. If I had been able to find a gas ring or even some coals, I might have made myself a cup of tea, French leave tea, in this house in which I had unwittingly invited myself. However, that was evidently out of the question, so I at last groped my way back to where I had left my Bouchard cakes, and then I groped my way back to the kitchen again, and there I groped about until I found a knife. For they always keep such things in the kitchen drawer. Having smelt it to make sure that it had not been used for onions or soap, I wiped it carefully on the inside of my skirt and then ventured to cut myself a large piece of cake. I had not much difficulty in finding a cup, and after making sure that it was clean, I filled it from the tap, and there I sat in the dark. Eating my rich cake and drinking my ice cold water, which seemed to go down my poor inside like a frozen waterfall. All the same, I felt better when I had disposed of my wedge of cake, and I felt very grateful to Bouchard for occupying the precise situation in Oxford Street which had attracted my attention. Hours went by. At all events, they seemed like hours to me, for I had sat myself down to wait patiently till morning light should shed some ray of hope upon my desperate situation. When morning came, I would write a note and throw it down in the courtyard, or I would pick up a few inexpensive articles of crockery and send them down smash and so attract attention that way. I felt that it would be useless to shout into this fog. It would be like calling down a coal mine, and to tell you the truth, I did not like in the darkness to open any of the windows.
At last I began to get desperately sleepy. You see, I was not accustomed to sitting in utter darkness, and as there is nothing so fatiguing to the eyes as staring into the night, I closed them in order to prevent myself from getting a bad attack of neuralgia. It was very uncomfortable in that hard, straight-up chair, which was evidently one of the Windsor persuasion, with a not very soft cushion tied onto the seat. Then an idea occurred to me. The flat was empty. I mean that its occupants were evidently away. So I came to the conclusion that I might as well go and lie down upon one of the beds. I knew which was the best bedroom. It was the same as my own. And I had good occasion to know that there was a big bed in it, for I had run against it with such force that I bruised myself severely. I therefore, after a last drink of cold water, got up and with care found my way to the best bedroom. The bed was a large and luxurious one, spread with a satin covered eiderdown. I happened to be wearing a sealskin coat which came down to my knees. It was a coat with a storm collar. On my head I had a toque of mink fur garnished with pink roses and some violets. I threw back the eiderdown quilt and got on to the bed, tucking myself well round with the soft satin cover. It was a glorious bed, a delicious bed, a bed that must have been made purposely for some poor wanderer like myself. The pillows were soft but not too soft, not pappy, you know, and they were nice pillows, as I could tell by the linen slips which covered them. There was embroidery at the corners and a small frill with a lace edge all round. They were much nicer pillows than my own. So I drew up my storm collar yet a little higher, snuggled down under the coverlet, and in five minutes I was sound asleep. 2. I do not know how long I had slept. You see, I had no means of knowing how the time had passed since I was entrapped, I might almost say entombed, in the strange dwelling of some person unknown to me. I seemed to have been asleep for many hours when I suddenly awoke. I came to myself with a start on realising that I was not in my own bed. Just at first I thought I had been awakened from my ordinary sleep and that my bed was on fire. But no, it was an electric light just over my head. I was not dreaming. Another light was shedding its brilliant rays over the dressing table, just where my own light hung, and an asbestos fire was burning cheerily in the grate. I had barely time to take all these things in and to locate the circumstances of my incarceration when I heard a voice which said, Good heavens! It was a man's voice, and my first instinct was to hold the satin-covered eiderdown still more closely round me. "'Who the dickens are you?' went on the voice. "'Sir,' said I in quavering accents. "'Madam, what are you doing in my bed?' said the voice indignantly. "'I don't understand this. You must go away, please.' "'I could not get out,' I cried piteously. No poor woman on earth could be less anxious to inflict herself upon you than I am, but I'm afraid I mistook your flat for my own. I dare say I looked very funny, for I still had my satin toque with the pink roses and violets on my head, and my storm collar was pulled well up above my ears. I live in one of these flats, I went on. I took a cab home from Bouchard's. Oh, that's where the Bouchard cakes came from, is it? he said. I went into the kitchen to make myself a cup of coffee, as I always do, and found cakes there, which I knew I had never supplied. Sir, what is the time? I asked. It is about three o'clock in the morning, rather more, he replied. At least it was three when I left the offices of the Daily Trumpeter. Is there a fog? I demanded. Oh, nothing to speak of now. Did you say you lived in these flats? I do, indeed I do. I live on the second floor of Block A. When I came home, the fog was so bad that I could not see the letter. Oh, three o'clock in the morning. What shall I do? What can I do? 
Well, the best thing you can do is to go home, he said sensibly. You must really forgive me, madam, for speaking as I did, but you must recognize that it was rather astounding for a hard work journalist to come home and find pink roses and violets rolled up in his eider down. I am sure I offer you ten thousand apologies for making so free with your belongings, I said apologetically. But it was so dark. Why didn't you turn up the lights? I would have done so, but I could not find the switches. I could not find any matches. And as I am not a new woman and do not smoke, I hadn't any with me. And I was so cold and so miserable, sitting in the darkness, wondering if my people had given orders to drag the river for me. Oh, yes, of course, there are your people to consider, he remarked. Will you excuse my asking you a plain question? Are you a married lady? No, I am not, I replied. I live in these mansions, as I told you, in number A block on the second floor. My name is Cheap. Oh, didn't Herbert Sargent marry a Miss Cheap? Yes, yes, she's my sister, I said eagerly. And Doreen, her eldest child, is staying with me now. She must be frightened out of her wits. Well, between you and me, Miss Cheap, I think it would take a good deal to frighten Miss Doreen. But that is neither here nor there. You must be got home, and you must be got out of this little affair with as little noise as possible. Look here, I'll leave you for a few minutes to put your hat straight and so on, while I go down and reconnoitre. Why didn't you think of the tradesman's entrance? I did. It was locked. Everything's locked, I said in a tragic voice. That's because the old woman who looks after me and gets my breakfast takes the key to let herself in with, and the handle is off the inner door. That's why you could not get out there. I expect it rolled down when you let it slip, too. You had better leave your cakes behind you. You'll have to tell your people that you got lost in the fog, and nobody will believe that you hung on to those two heavy cakes all the time. Now, look here, Miss Cheap. I'm Barclay of the Daily Trumpeter, Raymond Barclay. We've got to tell the same story. You got lost in the fog, and I picked you up and convoyed you home safe. Now, is that clear? Oh, yes, thank you. Quite, quite clear. I won't be two minutes putting my hair straight. All right, he said, and picking up his fur-lined coat, he went out, shutting the door noiselessly after him. I put my hair straight with trembling fingers and pinned on my smart flower-decked toque. I made myself look as decent as I could. My handkerchief I had left on the bed, but what did I do with my gloves? I went to the door and opened it. Mr. Barclay, I must have my gloves. What did I do with them? Can I have left them in the kitchen? Yes, I did see a pair of ladies' gloves in there, he said with a laugh. I thought my old woman had bloomed out that way. Now, keep close behind me when you go downstairs. I have been down once. All is as quiet as the grave, and if we can get out of this building and round to your own entrance without anyone seeing us, no one will know that you have been here at all. If we should chance to meet anyone, shrink back. Get out of sight. Don't let them see you. We must dissemble. There was no more light on the staircase than the gleam from the electric lamp which burned all night in the central hall. We descended the stairs like a couple of thieves, he going first and I following at a respectful distance. My heart beat furiously as I reached the lower flight. A few more steps and I should be safe. I should be out in the protective night and nobody but Raymond Barclay would be any the wiser as to the exact locality in which I had lost myself. Fortune favoured me. Not a soul came on the scene, and we gained the outer door in safety. "'It's all right,' he said. "'Why, you are trembling like a leaf. Here, take my arm. Remember your story, and I'll see you through it.' I was hideously frightened. So frightened was I that I quite forgot to thank him, but clung to his arm like grim death, and he piloted me without further loss of time to my own entrance. "'Have you got your key?' he asked. "'Oh, I have left it in your flat,' I replied. 
Where? said he. Oh, how stupid of me! I don't know. I let myself in with it. I don't know what I did with it after that. It doesn't matter. I'll go back for it. Even then, that angelic man didn't call me a fool, and I think he really would have been perfectly justified if he had. You had better stand here in the shade, he said, and wait for me. I won't be two minutes. All right, I returned. You are sure you'll not be frightened? No, no, I'm not a bit frightened. As a matter of fact, my teeth were chattering, but not with that kind of fear, as you can very well understand. In less than two minutes, he returned. Found it the very first thing, he said triumphantly. I trod on it just inside the front door. The rule of our flats was that each occupant had a ring given to him on taking possession of his apartment. Upon this ring were two keys: the pass key of the outer entrance and the latch key of the flat. I don't know," said Mr. Barclay in an undertone as we stole towards the stairs. How it comes that your key unlocks my door? There is something wrong about that. I shall make a fuss about it tomorrow. Oh, don't! It'll give me away if you do. I cried. Ah,、oh, so it would. Then I must be mum. Remember your story. I picked you up on my way home from the Daily Trumpeter. Yes, yes, I replied. I will not forget. I knocked lightly at my own door. There was a sound of voices within, and Dorian came rushing out. Oh, Auntie! She cried. We've been nearly frantic about you, and you're with Mr. Barclay. How funny! I don't know about its being funny," said Mr. Barclay. It might have been funny if she had not been with me. Owing to the terrible fog, I found your aunt hopelessly lost. She put herself in my care, and I have convoyed her safely here. She is very cold and very tired, so don't ask her any questions, but give her something hot to drink and put her to bed. But you will come in, won't you? I said faintly. I wanted to have a good cry, a real good cry. Not tonight, not tonight," he said cheerily. "Bed is the best place for wandering ladies and tired-out journalists. I will come in tomorrow and see if you're any the worse." He did call the next day, and on Christmas Day he sent me the loveliest posy that I ever saw in my life. France roses and double violets, done up in a basket lined with pink satin, edged with a border of mink fur. Why, Auntie said Doreen, "It's just like your toque. It's the quaintest fancy I've ever seen." I felt myself blushing and found it very convenient to hide my face in the flowers, but I didn't tell Doreen the meaning of that quaint conceit. It was a little secret which I kept to myself. I cannot think," said Doreen that afternoon when Mr. Barclay had come in again just to see if I was any the worse. You know, I cannot think how Auntie managed to lose herself for so long, because there was not much fog after about eight o'clock. Mr. Barclay avoided the question. I suppose you were dreadfully frightened and upset, and thought there had been an accident. Said he, "Oh yes, we thought of all sorts of things. We thought of an accident first, so we took a cab and went to ever so many hospitals, Barbara and I. Then the fog began to lift, and we wondered if we ought to go to the police. Only it seemed so funny to mix Andy up with the police station." I put up my hand and laid it on hers. "I am so glad you did not go to the police, dear child," I said. Because although I got lost, I got home safe after all, thanks to Mister Barclay, and I would rather you did not tell anyone about it, Doreen, because it sounds so odd for a woman of my age to own that she got lost in London. Poor Auntie," said Doreen. "Well, it might have been worse," said Mister Barclay. And as I am going to be married to Raymond Barclay in about six weeks' time. I quite agree with him. End of a Christmas Fog by John Str.